Uh, Sweden is a quite small country with a quite small scale. <clears throat> so this would be a huge contrast uh, to what Raymond was talking about. I live in a rural city area. Uh, my community takes uh, about a one hour drive to get from one end to another. And in that area we live around 4,000 people, which is the same amount of people as in one of Raymond's buildings. Um, I put the title, The History of Swedish Firefighting. Uh, maybe it should rather be one history or a history, because the history is uh, subjective. It's something that we construct. And this is my construction of the history. Um, you have all heard the stories about uh, Anders Laurien, the baker, uh, Bagan, in Stockholm that introduced container train in Sweden because he wanted that his firefighters should have seen a real fire be be uh, before they were turning out to, uh, to their first calls. And back in those days, there were no mandatory national education system. There were no national curriculum for firefighters. Uh, most fire services probably make a decent job, uh, but there were no systematic approach whatsoever on, uh, on education. And about uh, Christy Giesesson and Mats Rosander, who started to teach at the National College, uh, that there is much more in the fire than just the base of the fire. They introduced the concept of smoke, smoke gases, or whatever we would like to call them. There was, this was this National Fire College in Stockholm, uh, but not all firefighters ended up there, and in particular not the part-timers, the retained firefighters. So, Giselson and Rosander, they started to describe this flashover process. They developed a tool to handle this, the fog fighter. Uh, in other parts of Sweden, in the south, there was another man, uh, Lennart Strand, who developed the fog nail. It's more or less in the same period. But it's not self-evident that you get through just because you have great, uh, good ideas. I mean, this room is full of people with great ideas. Some of these ideal ideas will hit the wall. Some of them will create history. And right now, we don't know actually which uh, that would hit the wall and which will create history. So I wonder, how come that these people had such an impact on the Swedish firefighting history and indeed in the international world of firefighting. And I think that you have to go far way back in the history to find the roots for this. So let's start by looking at the pro fire problem in Sweden historically. In Sweden 150 years ago most cities looked like this. Uh, small villages, wooden constructions, uh, although the streets were much more narrower, about half the width or even more nar narrow than that. Now Sweden is a country of forests, at least if you go um, 100 kilometers northwards. Uh, and even the roofs were made of wooden materials. But if you build your buildings with the same materials that you later on heat them with, maybe this material gets confused sometimes whether it's a building material or a heating material. <laughs> uh, Omol, uh, at the upper photo, at that time, was quite a small town. 
it was rebuilt and it still is a small town. I selected it, that photo because it's one of the last major city fires in Sweden. The fire broke out at night in a backyard shed. <clears throat> it grew large before it was detected and after some hours the fire had consumed most parts of the city. Those fires didn't kill much people, but the property losses were that much bigger. <clears throat> of course they tried to fight the fires, but to be honest, a fire of that magnitude that had developed the first building uh, wasn't extinguished at all. It ran out of fuel. Uh, the buckets, the small pumps, did perhaps do some local good, have some local effect, but that is more or less all that is. Now, what were the causes of the fires? It more or less the same causes as we see today. The single most important contributing factor at that time was actually war. The single most common cause for a city fire in Sweden historically was acts of war. Cities was burned down by the enemy or indeed by their own troops in a scorched earth policy. And just until 200 years ago, uh, war was the normal conditions in Sweden and peace was the exception. And if you look worldwide, I can't actually recall any war that hasn't brought destruction with it. And they are still causing troubles. I mean, Jane, uh, Jens yesterday told about a bomb causing problems 75 years later. So if you want to fight fires, you should start with promoting peace and the ending of conflicts. The way of creating peace in Sweden was to give up the idea of being uh, an empire, to give the Polish uh, people their freedom, uh, to end up passing around in Germany, give half of the nation to Russia, and eventually uh, we got peace. But the civil fires continued with a devastating force. You saw the picture from Åmål in 1901, which was one of the last, making 1,200 people homeless. And many of this, those fires raised about half to 80 to 90 percent of the of the cities. Stockholm, 1751, 10,000 people homeless. Gothenburg, 1804, 8,000 people homeless. And that's just one of the 13 major fires uh, during the history. Borås has been erased from the map four times. Yevle, 1869, 8,000 people homeless. Karlstad, 1865, 5,000 people homeless, and so on. The peak was in 25th of June, 1888, when two cities, one village and one factory village burnt at the same day. The factory village was a small, on a small island up north called Sande, and that's the location where the other college of the MSB is located now, 130 years later. So something had to be done. The technical knowledge has, had been around for a century. And in fact, most cities that had burned down got effective local fire codes afterwards with a fairly similar content. You were limiting the building height for wooden constructions. You made it mandatory to have uh, a non-combustible roof materials. Um, 
to limit the damage from fire brands. You made fire separation between buildings. You made the streets wider. Or in essence, replaced the shacks with decent buildings. In 1874, it took half a century from the first proposal, 50 years, and we think that time, uh, things take a long time nowadays. It took 50 years from the first proposal. The government had had enough. The issue was lifted from a local level. The fires were, were actually a threat to the society. Banks and insurance companies were collapsing. So we got this national building code and linked to that a national fire code. And since these were fully implemented, there hasn't been any major city fires in Sweden. It took some years to implement it, the regulation. The peak came 14 years afterwards, after the implementation. So it is a problem to retrofit fire safety. And we got our first fire brigades. Gothenburg, 1872, with the first full-time station. With state-of-the-art technology and management, we got hoses from Holland, pumps from Britain, organization from Germany and from Britain. And there was virtually nothing that was kept from the traditional brigades based on a civil duty. But soon we took our own path. No one else in the world is using the Swedish standard host coupling. Celebrating 100 years today. So the visiting Polish uh, guest has to have a host adapter. And from the motorization and on, fire engines has been built in Sweden for the Swedish market. And the process of creating a modern fire service took some further 50 years. Now the society evolved. Concrete was introduced in the buildings. And suddenly it became cheap to build a fire resistant trusses. And we introduced the principle that every apartment should have a one hour fire resistant rating. And eventually most fires ended up including one apartment or less. So the fire that had before destroyed the whole, the whole town, now was contained in one single compartment, which is a huge step. And there was, of course, other factors influencing the, uh, the fire service. Post-World Wars, there were a lot of building and infrastructure projects around in Sweden. In 1965, they were digging a communication tunnel right under Stockholm. Uh, they were digging several uh, tunnels, but in 1965, one of those construction tunnels uh, collapsed. Two tunnel workers were trapped behind a 400 meter thick wall of mud in the center of Stockholm. And no one beside the tunnel company was responsible for the rescue operation. And this wasn't of course acceptable, so a fire officer from the Stockholm Fire Brigade gathered all parties of interest, including the insurance company, including companies with heavy tools, uh, large pumps and so on, and with joint efforts they made up a strategy. It took them a week to for divers to actually dig their way through 
through the mud under, under the constant risk of further collapse. And this was in the youth of television. So Swedish television got a camera on scene and broadcasted. The two tunnel workers were rescued, the operation was a success, with the whole nation on the front row. It took a couple of years and studies and investigation, but in 1974 the fire brigades turned to rescue services and got responsible for other types of accidents than fires as well. Um, as I said earlier, peace is good for fire safety. And no of the world wars were fought on Swedish soil. But we made some preparations, including building up a huge organization for civil protection, including wartime fire brigades. So keep that in mind. <coughs> but during this period, there was another trend. We had the fire brigades, which got greater responsibility. But we also had the civil defense system based on these World War experiences. And the sense was that it was not cost effective to have these two separate systems for rescue operations. So they were gradually merged together. Because there's no fundamental difference in between fighting a fire in a peacetime during a crisis or at war. And in 1986, the Swedish Rescue Services Agency was founded. <coughs> from these two agencies dealing with fire issues and civil defense. And the fire brigade culture became dominant in this new agency. It had lots of money from the civil defense. It had the mandate to give education to all Swedish firefighters. Not just the professional ones, but also the retained, or the part-timers, who were scheduled a nine-week education. And giving a national education means that you take the firefighters out of their fire service bubble. You take them out of their context and give them a similar message, which reduced the each local fire service being an isolated island. And this was the perfect timing to introduce firefighters safety and flash over containers. Uh, during th this period, the early 70s, uh, lots of authorities was reorganized. A parallel trend from the early 1970s was delocalization of agencies and institutions from Stockholm out to smaller cities around in the country. Fire research had its roots in, at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm ended up with a testing part at SP in Borås, and, which is now called RISE, and with the academic part at Lund University, where Professor Ove Pettersson was building a new research area, developed the Department of Building Statics to a Department of Fire Safety Engineering. Now, looking at the Lund University logo, you find two things. It says 1666, which for most people in the fire business around the world uh, is synonymous with the Great Fire of London. For Swedes, at least in the southern part, it is the year that Lund University was founded. And above the lion, it says Ad Utrumkve. Which translated from Latin says, be prepared to both. <coughs> to use the sword, but also to use the book. 
both knowledge and action. Now, Uwe Petersson was moving fire science to Lund and started to build this area of research. And as we saw from the tunnel collapse, the area is driven by catastrophes. Yesterday we heard Richard, uh, Ricardo talking about their 2008 warehouse fire. Peter talked about their Forward Avenue Drive um, fire in 2007. In Sweden, there were two major wake-up calls in the 1970s. Um, in 1978, the 10th of June, there was a high school graduation party at the City Hotel of Borås. At around 2.30 2 in the morning, there was 150 people still having a good time in the discotheque on the first floor. Most likely a cigarette was thrown in a waste bin on the ground floor next to the main entrance. The main stairs was blocked and there were poor means of secondary escape from the first floor. Out of the 150 people still in the premises, uh, about one third got wounded, 20 people died, most of them in the aged 18 to 20. Um, I grew up in Borås and was 10 years at the time, and my oldest brother was 15. This tragedy lifted fire safety to a national level, to a governmental investigation. And the investigation con concluded that there is a demand for deeper understanding and more widespread knowledge about fires, in essence. <laughs> After a huge debate, the small fire chief's course that had been around for 30 to 50 years was replaced <coughs> by an academic program in fire safety engineering at Lund University from 1986. From now on, the people responsible for fire rescue operations, and in particular fires, spoke the same language as the people creating the fire safety solutions. Builders, architects. And also, this means that we have the base for our current Swedish <coughs> two-tier entry system. Uh, talking about reorganization, delocalization, the National Board of Housing and Planning, Boverket, was founded in 1988 out of a few other uh, agencies. It was relocated to Karlskrona in a similar way. They employed new enthusiastic fire protection engineers, which bedded for a new view on building regulations. And shortly after, the model of performance-based codes was launched in Sweden, in the way that, that art described yesterday. I said that there was two major wake-up calls. The other one, <clears throat> going back a little. In 1975, there was a fire in a <coughs> repair shop for commuter trains in Stockholm. Uh, the cushions from train seats created a dense black smoke. Two firefighters got disoriented and was lost in that fire. The materials that burned was more or less the same as involved in the Stardust fire on Ireland a few years later. And the fire stuck to all the physical rules that we know about now. Going to flashover, getting underventilated. <coughs> However, this behavior was not known at the time. And to firefighters, two firefighters lost their lives, in spite of having good clothes, state-of-the-art SCBAs. 
<coughs> Plastics had been introduced in the society. And, well, you all are familiar with the UL studies of modern legacy fires. The introduction of larger amounts of materials having a higher energy content led to faster growing and more severe fires. And there was a growing awareness of this, both among firefighters, among fire researchers, among legislators at this time already. In the small and in the common apartment fire, the bulk of fires, this isn't a big problem. But in a repair shop, or in a hotel. And the practice that was used at that time was the one that Nisse Bergström talked about uh, earlier. These instruction pictures were printed in 1946 that the most effective way to fight a fire is to get close and aim at the base. Wrong to attack the fire from, far, uh, from a far distance. Correct to attack at a close distance and aim at the base of the fire. At these pictures from 46, they used a linen coat and a state-of-the-art filter mask. But the protective equipment evolved with woolen coats, eventually Nomex, SCBAs was inter were introduced. And this protective equipment allowed the firefighters to, to get deeper into the building. In essence, fires got worse at the same time as firefighters were able to get deeper into the fire, deeper into the problem. Which also reflects in the statistics of line of duty death in Sweden. And during the 1980s, the number of line of duty deaths had increased to around one every year, or even a bit higher. Something had to be done. And the problem was solved as the problem with city fires by lifting the problem from the local level, lifting it from the fire service, from the fire society, to a work health issue on a national level. It took some time, but it eventually had effect. And today, it's a unique event if a firefighter gets killed in a fire. There is actually one this year. It was uh, uh, out in the forest, a fireman falling down from a cliff, which is not the same as these uh, building fires that we're talking about here. These work and health regulations made actually no major changes in the structure of the fire brigades. We still have a group of dedicated people dressed in the best clothes on the market, turning up with a big, commonly red, but not always, toolbox with lots of fancy equipment and a couple of thousand of liters of water. That hasn't changed over the years. What has changed was the attitude, the culture. This document for, for a Swedish firefighter has more or less the same status as the constitution for Ed and other Americans. Still, most firefighters on their education wanted to be in that SCBA hot training until they threw up. The new work health regulation put up a framework for that. And slowly there was an insight that a firefighter in trouble 
is actually jeopardizing the operation. And also the obligation for the file service to actually make sure that their employees were getting home safe to their families after work. So we got this regulation in 1986. It has been updated a few times. And it includes several points. To be a firefighter performing interior firefighting, you had to have a medical check by a doctor on your heart to get rid of the cardiac problems. You have to have a fitness test every year. You should prove that you actually can perform the 200 watt on a test bike. You have to have knowledge. A 56 hour basic training specified. You also have an annual dose of training, two hot sessions, two cold sessions, every year. They put demands on the organization. You should be two firefighters inside the building. Not more, not less. At the door, you should have a designated team leader with no other duties. You should have one commander of the operation and you should have one pump operator. That makes five people. You have to make a risk assessment. Is this actually the most safe way to put the fire out? The small part, essential but small, is you of course have to have certain equipment, a decent fire gear, an SCBA, a radio, a pass, and so on. And the golden rule about, uh, above the all, you always bring a hose in Sweden. And one underlying aspect of this regulation can be posed like this, that all firefighters are created equal. The task of interior firefighting puts the same demand regardless you're a professional, a retained, or a fully volunteer firefighter. And thereby, the demands on the fire service, on the firefighters, are actually the same. And the Swedish work health regulations don't take into account what is whatsoever the mode of employment. Now, it takes some time for regulation to have effect, unfortunately. This fire in Stockholm in 1986 have large similarities with the one Ricardo showed yesterday. It was a store for building materials, 60 by 90 meters, that caught fire on October 19, 1986. Uh, the roof was insulated with polystyrene, covered with asphalt paper. And about half an hour into the operation, the fire has been burning for quite a long time, a BA team was assigned to check onto a wall with a 60-minute fire resistant rating. This wall separated one store area from another store area. They went in, they broke up a door between uh, the two parts, they saw fire coming towards them. What they didn't know about was that there was another uh, door opening between these areas that had been open for the whole fire. Spilling smoke up to the compartment that they entered. A few m moments later, they said on the radio, and maybe Ed, if you would guess what they were saying. It's getting, it's getting hot in here. Which is a common pre-made uh, phrase. And they were ordered to retrieve. On their way back, 
they were they were 40 50 meters from the exit there was something that in the report was called a fire gas explosion sending flames 10 to 15 meters out of the opening there were attempts to rescue them and there was radio contact for several minutes but the colleagues on the outside was unable to fight the fire and couldn't find them until three hours later when the national investigation was finished the conclusion from the investigation board was that the launched system that hadn't came into action at this time was satisfying but the work should be intensified just a few years later it could look like this this concept spread throughout Sweden as every firefighter had to have an annual hot training more or less every fire brigade had to make their own uh, training facility their own containers and this is in Gothenburg in another part of the uh, of the country we have this elevated demo cell we have the fog fighter we have the board chipboards on fires we have the enthusiastic students lots of smoke lots of fire at this time the length of the pulses was a big issue uh, it became more or less a sport to have the shortest pulses uh, and indeed in a small container a short pulse is sufficient to put out flaming gases something that might have been said but rarely learned is that if the gas volume is bigger the pulse also have to be rather most firefighters trained a behavior in the small cell that might actually have been inappropriate in a larger environment uh, so to summarize Sweden have had its share of <coughs> line of duty death there has been fire problems and there has been fire problems but that were so big that they couldn't be solved by the fire service community and those problems or challenges was lifted to national level and actions were needed now with new work health regulations came in place re requiring education the demo cell was developed in parallel a new nozzle was developed that could handle burning gases these new tools was introduced to the classes and the teachers started to build a theoretic framework around it and the teachers that were starting to talk about this was Mats Sander and Christy Giseson and a few others and the time it couldn't have been better because all this was in place when the rescue services agency was formed and they launched it, this massive education program at four colleges around in Sweden so that's the history where are we going and where are we now now the Swedish rescue services agency had to gradually reduce its costs and eventually two out of the four schools was closed the education for professional firefighters has increased to two-year education while the education for part-timers or retained firefighters has been reduced by almost half to six weeks a tsunami on the other side of the globe 
brought awareness uh, of the demand for crisis management reorganization of national authorities, making the Rescue Services Agency to be part of this new Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency with a quite broad responsibility, making firefighting a small part in that agency. While the response crews in many cities has decreased in numbers, brigades are trying to find alternative solutions on how to perform firefighting. And in particular, particular, with the growing awareness that firefighters are not just exposed to the acute risks, but also that being exposed to smoke may have long-term health effects. But I would say that the overall conclusion is that Sweden doesn't play its own game anymore. We are part of the international community. We still have our own regulation, but we share a common knowledge with you all. And sometimes you need some help from a friend. I know that all of you have come here actually to talk to each other. So, so this is the end of my presentation. Uh, it's a bit shorter than the hour in the schedule. I'm sure you won't have any, have any problems with that because I know that you have all very interesting uh, questions to discuss with each other. So, thank you very much. Thank you.